Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to supplementary materials. So now let's tackle our last couple of topics in the supplementary section. The issue we want to talk about now is the issue of relaying the hadith by meaning versus exact words. And this was a significant issue which concerned the hadith scholars. Uh, they posed the question as to whether the narrator needed to relay the hadith in the exact words used by the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him, and this is known as Nas. Nas is saying it precisely as he said it, or whether he could just relay the meaning of the hadith. Now your mind may immediately jump to the notion that, well, of course the hadith needs to be relayed precisely as the Prophet said it. However, remember, for example, that any time we quote a hadith in English, we are relaying the meaning of the hadith and not relaying the nas of the hadith, and few of us consider that this invalidates the hadith that we have quoted. So on the whole, most scholars feel that it is acceptable to relay the meaning of the hadith, provided that this is done accurately. And in fact, most of the hadiths that come to us in the hadith books, even Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, are relayed in this way. The meaning, but not necessarily the exact words that the Prophet used. Now, the hadith scholars have set up some conditions to accept narration by meaning. Number one, the narrator needs to have knowledge of the Arabic and of the words used by the Prophet. So when you read hadith, you actually find that the Arabic of hadith is somewhat different than the Arabic of the Qur'an. The Qur'an has really stayed current, if you will, uh, to, to use uh, that kind of terminology. In other words, if you speak classical Arabic, you can in general fairly easily understand at least most of the Qur'an. However, looking at hadith, that is actually quite different. Uh, and, and that is a separate topic, of course, but that may be one of the proofs that the Prophet did not alter the Quran. The hadith literature contains a lot of very arcane, very archaic words uh, for us now, and is, is actually a different style and different sort of uh, Arabic um, uh, verbiage than the Quran. So the person not only needs to know Arabic, but needs to know the words used by the Prophet. Uh, number two, that some of the scholars have said there should be a necessity to relay by meaning instead of using the exact words. So in our context, one such necessity may be that the listener or reader doesn't speak Arabic at the level of understanding the arcane language sometimes used in hadith, so it becomes necessary to relay the hadith in a different language, say English, Urdu, Farsi, etc. Uh, most scholars have agreed on the above two conditions. Now, interestingly, they differed on a third condition. Some of them said that it was necessary that the narrator have forgotten the precise wording used by the prophet and this would, essence, uh, would in essence fall under excuse number two above, that that's why there's a necessity to relay the meaning because the narrator forgot the precise words, but he clearly remembers the meaning. Other scholars actually took the diametrically opposite point of view. They said that the hadith could only be relayed by meaning if the narrator knew the exact words. Uh, because that's the only way that we could guarantee that he relayed the correct meaning. If he forgot the exact words, then maybe he gets himself mixed up or herself mixed up and uh, gives you the wrong meaning. And so they said that you could narrate it by meaning only if you remember the exact words, but for whatever reason, like for example, the person uh, receiving the hadith may not be able to understand the exact words, then you give them uh, the meaning. So if I am talking to a non-Arabic speaker, instead of saying بالنيات, I say, well, actions are rewarded according to intentions. 
uh, while I remember the exact wording, but I have a reason that I am using different wording to relay the meaning. So um, those are some of the issues uh, surrounding this topic as to whether hadith is relayed by meaning or exact words. And again, uh, I'd like to stress to you a point that a lot of people may not be quite aware of, is that most of the hadiths that we have in the hadith literature are actually relayed by meaning. That doesn't mean it doesn't contain any of the exact words of the Prophet. It just means that it is not always, or in most cases, a direct verbatim quote uh, from uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him. Okay, now let's move on to another topic. Okay, now let's look at some issues regarding the number of hadiths transmitted and the differences between the two sahihs. And... Um, like I said, the supplementary section is really dealing with a lot of different separate issues, uh, but I think you'll be able to sort of relate them back to the main bulk of Module 1. So it's interesting to kind of pause and reflect on the number of hadiths transmitted by the companions. And again, a lot of this information is not necessarily known to kind of, um, you know, the beginning student. Uh, but there are actually vast differences in the number of hadiths transmitted by individual companions. So by far the most prolific transmitter is Abu Huraira, who died in the year 58 Hijri. And he knew the Prophet for only the last three years of his life, some people say even closer to two years, and he transmitted about 5,300 hadiths. Now, Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, is the second largest source with about 2,600 hadiths. And he was 23 years old when the Prophet died, but he had become a Muslim very early and lived his life quite close to the Prophet, peace be upon him. The third is Anas ibn Malik, who was a servant in the household of the Prophet beginning at the age of 10, and he reported 2,300 uh, hadiths. Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, narrated about 2,200 hadiths, and Ibn Abbas, who was only 14 when the Prophet died, narrated about 1,700 hadiths. Now, these numbers are to be contrasted with the number of hadiths relayed by the Prophet's closest companions from the Sahaba, like Abu Bakr, Omar ibn al-Khattab, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, who relayed 142 537 and 536 hadiths, respectively. So we see that while Abu Huraira, who knew the Prophet for two or three years toward the end of his life, relays 5,300 uh, uh, hadiths, Abu Bakr, who knew him his entire life essentially, relays only 142 hadiths. Now, according to the scholar Ibn al Jawzi, uh, there are over a thousand companions, about a thousand and sixty companions who narrated hadiths. About 500 of them related only one hadith, 132 related two hadiths, 80 related three hadiths, 52 related four hadiths, and of the over 1,000 companions relating hadith, only 55 related 100 or more hadiths, while only 11 related more than 500 hadiths. However, these numbers also account for different channels where the hadith is transmitted via the same companion or slightly different narration, so they're not to be taken precisely, they're just to give you a rough idea that these numbers varied a great deal. And so Abu Huraira may have related something on the order of 1,236 individual distinct hadiths, and then his numbers, because of different chains of narration, gets inflated to 5,300. But that same factor applies to the other companions. And so the relative ratios would probably remain somewhat similar to what the above numbers give. Why do we go through this? Well, in general, the Sunni position is that all companions are on an equal tier of righteousness and are not subject to the critical examination that other narrators of hadith are. We've already talked about this. So, as stated by Professor Jonathan Brown, the early Ahlul Hadith preached that, quote, anyone 
who impugns reports from the early community or denies anything from the hadiths of the Messenger of God than doubt his Islam. And this particular quote is taken from the book Sharh al-Sunnah, explaining the Sunnah uh, by al-Barbahari. Um, and the, so I think that these numbers raise some serious questions. On the other hand, the orthodox view is that one cannot raise these questions. I, I think these questions beyond the level of the beginning student, at the level of the advanced student, should be raised. I think the Sunnah deserves that. Because to me, it is somewhat concerning, and I'm of course not by far not the first one to raise these concerns, that Abu Huraira, who uh, knew the Prophet for two to three years, narrates over 5,000 hadiths. And in conservative circles, it's nearly heretical to raise these concerns, but they have been raised previously by modern reformist Muslims, uh, most prominently, for example, by the Egyptian Mahmoud Abu Raya. He died in 1970, and he was a student of the leading modern Islamic reformist Rashid Rida, who authored uh, most of the Tafsir al-Manar. So uh, Abu Raya um, authored a very nice and very little known work called Adwa ala Sunnah al muhammadiyya uh, shining the lights on the Muhammadan Sunnah, where he actually very strongly attacked the reliability of Abu Huraira, using in part reports from both Sunni and Shi'i books on Hadith criticism. Uh, and uh, you can find a reference to this in Professor Jonathan Brown's uh, book Hadith, page 247. And in fact, it seems that several of the companions raised some reservations about Abu Huraira. That's not a modernist, reformist kind of phenomena. And it's reported that Umar ibn al-Khattab was concerned about his excessive collection and narration of hadiths and said to him, quote, I say, let the Prophet's words alone, or indeed I will send you back to the lands of your tribe, Daus. In any case, we note that since Abu Huraira and Ibn Abbas do not usually narrate hadiths by saying, I heard the Prophet or the Prophet said to me, but simply the Prophet said, this is taken by some to indicate that most uh, of the hadiths that they heard, they actually heard from older companions who had been with the Prophet much longer, uh, and then they just sort of drop the name of that companion and say the Prophet said. There is little doubt, however, that they both devoted themselves to the study and collection of hadiths, and that when Abu Huraira died, he had a large store of written materials or sahifas of the hadiths he had compiled that he then passed on to his students. And so I am not trying to uh, in any way impugn their character, but I am raising objective issues that I think um, the, the, the Sunnah deserves uh, to have raised. Okay, a last thing to touch on is just a brief comparison between our two most authentic hadith books, the Sahih of Bukhari and the Sahih of Muslim. And they contain material from 208 and 213 companions, respectively. Of these, 149 companions are common between the two works, and uh, the discrepancy uh, of about 25% of the narrators between the two sahihs may be an issue of some concern. And it's worth at this juncture uh, me, uh, mentioning that probably if you want what we would have to consider the strongest, most authentic hadiths we have available, uh, that can be found in a collection uh, where the hadiths that both Bukhari and Muslim report and have in common have been compiled together. And this is, a, a, of course, a later compilation than when they each compiled their own work. It's a fairly modern compilation. And for your reference, it is called Al-Lu'lu'u wal-Marjan fima tafaqa alayhi al-Shaykhan. That uh, title may be loosely translated as the pearls uh, that the two sheikhs have agreed upon, uh, meaning the pearls of hadith 
that the two sheikhs have agreed upon, uh, lo means pearls and marjan is um, either small pearls or corals or uh, beautiful red pieces of coral. So in any case, why don't we just say the gems uh, in parentheses of hadith that the two sheikhs, uh, al-Bukhari and Muslim, have agreed upon. Uh, so um, hopefully this uh, supplementary material was also useful to you. And inshallah, from here now, we move on to module two, which I think is, um, uh, inshallah, much more interesting to you. It will be the application of hadiths and all of the issues that go into that. But of course, before getting to that more interesting material, we did have to cover some of the more technical issues of hadith authentication and classification. I hope, inshallah, that you feel you've learned something from this and that you uh, have found it useful and found it interesting and um, are now looking forward to module two. Salamu alaikum and God bless.